Shabbat Shalom. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to the Philadelphia Assembly. Uh, according to how we calculate the calendar, today is the first day of the fifth month of the year 5778. It's also July the 28th, 2018 on the Gregorian calendar. And uh, as we've spoke on here before, we keep the full moon as the new moon because of Psalms 81 verse 3. And the King James, it reads, uh, blow up the trumpet on the new moon at our solemn feast day, or on our solemn feast day. But in the most other translations, it's blow up the trumpet, or the ram's horn, literally, from the Hebrew, on the at the new moon, at the full moon, on our solemn feast day. So, absent from any other scripture in the Bible or that... that names out the new moon, we settle there. And that's where we do because I need a commandment. And I think most of the people that look at it that way, we need something that's thus saith the Lord. Okay? So that's why we're doing it. Doesn't mean our way is 100% right and everybody's 100% wrong. We're not saying that. We're just fully convinced in our own hearts that that's the way to go. So we're going to do that until God, He shows us another way. So my message today is that I'm going to continue in my expository teaching of the gospel according to Luke, and we're going to do part 7. Now, we, it's going to be uh, 13, 14, and according to the time limit, 15. There's less verses of scripture this week and less uh, places that I'm making connection to in the, in the Old Testament or Tanakh, so we're going to maybe cover three chapters, but I didn't want to put it down solidly because I want time to dictate I know that sometimes we can be long and drawn out, which a lot of us are used to those type of long messages, but there's a lot of you out there that probably aren't, and we want to make sure that everybody is edified in, the, in, the, in our teachings. Okay. Before I begin, let's turn toward the temple will be in the east, toward Jerusalem, and open in prayer. Almighty Father God, we just thank you for this Sabbath day, and we ask that you would bless it today as you did from the foundation of the world. Father, we just ask that you would anoint each and every one of us with that extra unction of your spirit, Father, and teach us all things. Have us know your word and not let it be ours. Father, give me the words to say. Don't let these be my words, but your words. And Father, we just ask that everyone be edified and built up in that. And Father, we, we also want to mention all those that are hurting and suffering and going through things in their lives. And we just ask that you lift all those believers up whether they be listening online or whether they don't or, or whether they're not. We just ask that your continued blessing be upon your believers, Father, those that trust you and keep your commandments. We ask all these things in your precious Son, Jesus, or Yahushua's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. We're going to jump right into Luke. And we're going to start out in chapter 13. Okay. So here we are, and we're setting the scene, you know. He says, there were present at that season, that time of year, some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So... Obviously, Pontius Pilate had punished some of those believers and killed them, and their blood was mingled with the sacrifices. That's definitely not a good thing. And Jesus answering said unto them, those that were speaking that about those with the Galileans. So obviously, he was speaking to the Galileans. And, and Jesus, or Yahushua answering, said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. Now, that might sound like a strange question to some, but a lot of times we get to thinking that, you know, the one time that God lays down judgment on one person different than he does the next, or he doesn't. And he does make tradition. He is a just and fair God. He knows what's good. Everybody that sins like that doesn't end up in a physical quick death. Sometimes they live a long time. Okay? Even with Cain, okay, when Cain slew Abel, 
God put, put him out in the wilderness, and the one thing that he said was is that if someone found him, they would recognize him, basically, and know who he was, and they would kill him. So God put a mark on Cain, and Cain lived out. He also said that if anybody killed Cain, they would receive seven times the consequences that Cain got. Now, Cain didn't, like, Cain didn't want to die. That's why he asked God that. But God also didn't want Cain to die because God had pronounced sentence on Cain that he was going to go through this tribulation, this time where he was separated and cut off from God. Okay, And, and, and God didn't want that time cut off. You know, sometimes the easiest thing is just to be put in the grave. Okay? But that's not always the case. And in this case, these guys that were killed by Pontius Pilate, you know, sometimes God's putting the judgment on them, but, and he uses people like Pontius Pilate to, to deliver that. And sometimes he puts them to death right away, or else he makes them live and go through a lot of tribulation. That's my point. So hope I don't carry out that too long, or I won't be doing three chapters. Okay? So, verse 3. He says, I tell you, and here's, here's Jesus, or Yahushua, who's answering this. He says, I say no, or nay, in the King James. But except you repent, you shall likewise perish. Now, that may be instantaneously because the hand of God comes upon you, or that might be when you get cast into the lake of fire. Whatever the case may be, if you don't repent of those sins, you're going to perish. And that's what, this is a call to repentance that our Messiah is giving. Okay? Verse 4, he says, On those 18 upon whom the tower of Salome fell and slew them, think you, that they were, were were sinners above all men that dwelled in Jerusalem? No. Man, look at all the horrific acts that happened in the temple, you know, with the with the uh, prophets, where they slew them between the altar and different things of that nature. Obviously, these ones that this tower fell on weren't the worst of all sinners. But Jesus didn't deny that the hand of God didn't fall upon them either. Okay? And... I looked for this many times before in the scripture, and it's really not. This is actually a, a current event, okay, that had happened and they all knew about. This, this uh, Salome is in what's known as the city of David, okay, the southern part of Jerusalem, or what they call the old city, okay? And that's not my word. It's going to be, you know, we'll just go through here and we'll see, okay? So... I tell you no, except you repent, you shall otherwise perish. These 18 were no more sinners than what some of the rest of them were, but so happens to be that at that point in time, God saw to allow them to perish physically. Okay? Then it says in verse 5, I tell you, here's his answer, no, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Okay? So, you might not perish instantly, but you will suffer judgment based on your actions, okay, if you don't repent, okay? If you do repent, obviously God puts our sins as far as the east is from the west. He puts it behind his back, never to remember it again. But if you don't, you, shoot, you too shall perish. He spake also this parable, okay, because, again, he that has ears to hear, let him hear, okay? And he that doesn't have ears to hear, don't let him hear. So he always taught in parables so that those that weren't called wouldn't hear in their in their ears, understand in their heart, and he would heal them. Okay? Because you have to be called before, before you can be chosen. Okay? So he said, he spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came out and sought fruit thereon and found none. Okay, we know... Jesus did the same thing when it was the fig tree. He came by, there wasn't anything there. But this is a lesson, a parable. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard. The dresser would be the husbandman that he hired to take care of his vineyard. Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it? Or, or why do you allow it to be in the ground? Okay. And he, the husbandman answered and said unto him, the one the hired, Lord or master, in this case, let it alone this year, also till I shall dung it, dung about it, or I'm sorry, dig about it, loosen the soil around it, and dung around it. Okay? So he meant work it, the ground around it, and then fertilize it to help it to grow. 
Now, that sounds confusing when you put it in connection to everything he said, but he shouldn't. Because all of us are like that fig tree. A lot of times we're not putting forth the fruit of the Spirit of things that God wants us to develop in our life. And sometimes God's got to work that dirt, that dirt that's around us, and he's got to put fertilizer on it so that we can become fertile and, and, and put forth fruit. And he ain't, and then he says in verse 9, And if it bear fruit, well, or good, that's added, but it's still good. And if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. So, again, everything in its own time and in its own season, and God is the rightful judge, and this master or Lord over this vineyard is the example of him, basically, explaining that he wanted to give that tree another chance to become fertile and bear fruit. Verse 10, And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. It reads in the King James. I went back to the Greek on this because I always do when it says Sabbath because I'm always interested whether it's plural or whether it's singular. And I'm not trying to read anything into it, but in this case it says one of the Sabbath. And when this began in verse 1, it said, These there were present at that season. Now we know we teach the word in season and out of season. This here probably is happening during some of the feast days. Not sure which one or even if that's absolute, okay, but I can see that that's supposed to be plural, and it says on one of the Sabbaths, and that could be talking about one of the seventh-day Sabbaths, or that could be talking on one of the high days, okay, but in any case, that's what it says. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity, okay, she was sick, she was weak, okay, and that, they, they were saying it was spiritual that was causing it, 18 years, and was bowed together could in no wise lift herself up, or she was bent over, humped over really bad, and she could not straighten herself up. Okay? In verse 12, and when Jesus, or Yahushua, or Yeshua, whichever way you want to pronounce that name, or you think it should be, saw her, he called her to him, and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity, or weakness, or sickness. Okay? He, he took that off. Now, you got to remember, these Pharisees are always looking for a reason to condemn him for doing some kind of work. First of all, he doesn't take credit. He gives the credit to his father when he heals somebody, and it's no work to heal somebody on the Sabbath day. There's nothing wrong with doing something good on the Sabbath, and he's going to set them up on it. He's going to set them straight on this situation. Okay? So he loosed her of her illness, and he, he laid his hands on her, and immediately, now this is another one of those signs of who our Messiah is that identifies him as the Messiah that was come, that was going to die for the sins of the world. Immediately she was made straight and she glorified Theon, or God. This Theon means the Most High. Okay, that's what she did. She praised the Most High. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because he's a hypocrite. And I'm not the one just saying that. Our Messiah is going to say that. Because that Jesus, or Yahushua, or Yeshua, had healed on the Sabbath day. And said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work. In them, therefore, come and be healed on the, ne on the next, and not on the Sabbath day. Okay, I'll get it right. So, he's condemning. For that. Now, he's not doing it without some some form of justification, okay? Even though he's wrong, he's using the scripture to support his beliefs. In Leviticus 23.3, it says we're not to do any work on the Sabbath day. So, if you consider healing on the Sabbath day work, then, then our Messiah would have violated the commandment, and then he couldn't be our Messiah, because then he would have sinned and fell short of the mark, and he would have just been somebody else, you know? Also in Exodus 20, 10, says the exact same thing. We don't have to go back there and read that. Write it down if you'd like and do the work yourself. Check me out. See if I'm not giving you the correct uh, connection. 15. The Lord, or the Master in this case, then answered him and said, he's talking about our Messiah when it says Master here, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass 
from the stall and lead him away to the watering? Sure they do. You know, I've heard people say they don't they don't even want to make sure their animals have food and water on the Sabbath day. They, they, you know, they think that they're going to fast or something. You don't have to fast on the Sabbath, neither do they. And did he not say, lead them away from their stall so that they need water? Nothing wrong with that, okay? That's is kind of a form of working. It's even servile because you're serving the animal, okay? But it's the right thing to do. And God never said not to do that, okay? So he, he asked them, don't you do that? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, so she's a physical son, or an Israelite, whom Satan hath bound, in other words, because this infirmity she had was spiritual, it identified it earlier, so he's putting the do where it belongs on Satan, okay, hath bound, lo, these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. Shouldn't she be released from this bond, this infirmity on the Sabbath day? Now notice what happened. He had exactly the right words to say at exactly the right time. And when he had said the, these things, all his adversaries, that's those that opposed him, were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him, which are all, again, eyewitness accounts of he, who he was. And that's why he's performing these miracles. He's fulfilling prophecy as well as helping these people. Okay? So, then said he, our Messiah, unto what is the kingdom of Elohim, or kingdom of God, Theo in Greek, like whereunto shall I resemble it, or what example should I make to make you understand this? Okay? He's going to draw an example. He said, it is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and cast it into his garden. Now, you know, the word of God's like that too. It's kind of like a mustard seed. You can cast it out into the garden, and it'll grow, and it'll grow in the heart. That garden will be your heart, okay, or your mind in your heart, okay? And it grew and grew, says whack, grew and wax, which means grew and grew, a great tree, and the fowls of the air lodged in the branches of it. Now, the seed didn't do that, but out of that faith sprang forth the mustard plant, okay? And it was large enough. So that little seed planted in the ground, as an example, that's how our faith is. It starts out just as a little tiny thing, and it can grow big enough to, for that the birds of the air rest in it. It grows us spiritually and matures us. It is, and then he says, is, is, it is like, and he's giving you another example, okay? And again he said, whereunto, whereunto shall I liken the kingdom of God? of Theoe in Greek for Elohim. It is like leaven. Now most of the time in the scripture, leaven is usually, you know, other places used as sin. But in this place, it's not, because it's talking about faith. Okay? And faith without works is dead. It is like leaven, which a woman took, just a little bit of leaven, and hid in three measures of the meal, till the whole was leavened. And and again, you know, this here is talking about our faith and how you, the whole person gets filled with that faith. Okay, so he's explaining this and showing how that leaven scatters out through the whole loaf and, and makes the whole lump holy. And that kind of goes back to Romans chapter 11 when it talks about if the first fruit was holy, okay, and that first fruit is talking about physical or the physical descendants of Israel was holy then the whole lump is holy. Okay? And that talks about that's talking about the fullness of Israel, the commonwealth of Israel. So it's important to get all these little nuances that are in the scripture. So that lump is the whole lump. That's what it's talking about. It could be the whole person or it could be the whole body of our Messiah, which is the commonwealth of Israel. Then verse 22, And he went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. He's on his way to Jerusalem. Okay. Then said one unto him, Master, are there few that are be saved? And you know what? Really, he's, he doesn't come directly on it, but he's telling them, yeah, there's going to be few that's going to be saved. Let's listen to how he says that. And he said unto them, Strive to enter. In other words, if there's nothing, no work in entering into the kingdom of heaven, what does strive mean here in the King James? It means to work. 
Okay, it means to press towards that, to enter in the straight gate. Now, for many, goes he says, for many I say unto you will seek to enter in, and that takes effort, and shall not be able. Okay, so many are called, but few are going to be chosen. So he said, seek or strive to go through that straight gate. When once the master of the house is risen up, okay, so now we're going, now he's going to give another parable here. He says, when once the master of the house is risen up and has shut to the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at that door, saying, Master, Master, this is curie, curie in the Greek. And that's what it means, is master in this case. Open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Or I know not where you came from. And he's not going to let them in. Okay? Verse 26. Then shall you begin to say, Master. I'm adding master here. We have eaten and drank in your presence. And you have taught in our streets. Talking about the Messiah. Okay? But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not. I know not whence or where you are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. And the word iniquity is lawlessness. All you that work lawlessness. Now, without our Messiah's shed blood, all of us would have to depart because we've all, at one time or another, been workers of iniquity. But we don't practice such things. If we practice such things, our reward will be the lake of fire. Okay? Especially when you've been called. Verse 28. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So in other words, when you're going in the lake of fire, you're going to see Abraham, you're going to see Isaac, and you're going to see Jacob, and all the prophets of the kingdom of Elohim, or Theo in the Greek, and yourselves thrust out. You're going to see that. If you don't repent, change your ways, and you continue to be a worker of iniquity. Okay, which we've all covered all the way through here. Okay, then he said, then he says, and behold, there are last, this is always the case, and behold, there are last, which shall be, did I skip one? 29, I'm sorry. And they shall come from the east and from the west, you're right, that's important, and from the north and from the south, and shall sit down in the kingdom of Elohim. Now, what that's telling you is everybody's not going to be coming from the land of Israel. They're going to be coming from the east. They're going to be coming from the west. This is all part of the grafting in that he's talking about here. So these people that are going to come and sit down in the kingdom of God are going to come from the basically the four corners of the earth. Okay. We know Israel will be scattered to the four corners of the earth, but obviously there's not just going to be physical descendants here. Okay. So now that I said that. Okay. And sit down in the kingdom of Elohim. And behold, there are, there are last, be there are last which shall be first. And there are first which shall be last. So, again, we, we are we're to be a servant. You know, and that's what we're all here to do. And so the one that here is on earth is that it's a servant. Shall be first. And the other one's going to be last. That's been a leader a lot of times in the kingdom. And this also could be talking about just... What you know, your rank and whatever. Okay, it says, and they, then it says in 30, and behold, I already read that, 31, the same day there came, so the same day that he just got done going through all these uh, parables, the same day there came certain of the Pharisees saying unto him, Get thee out and depart from hence or from here, for Herod will kill you. And he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, talking about Herod, Behold, because he was crafty just like a fox, Behold, I cast out demons, devils, it says in the King James, and I do cures today and tomorrow and the third day. I shall be perfected. And he's talking about being in the, in the grave for three days and three nights, and on the third day he's going to be perfected. Okay? He's going to receive a spiritual body. That's what that's talking about. So he's putting it right out there for him straight. Okay, he said, go and tell that fox. Okay, here's the evidence. See, Herod knew the signs of who the Messiah was. He might not have understood the three on the third day, but he understood that he was 
doing casting out demons. He was curing people. He was even raising people from the dead. And you know it. He said, go tell that fox that he's doing all these things. 33. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. So, he's not, his, his time has not yet come. He's letting them know that he's going to continue to walk and do what he's got to do all the way up until he is offered as our sacrifice for our past sins. Okay? And then in 34, he says, he, he, I can see he's crying out. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which kills the prophets. And our Messiah was both prophet, priest, and king. Okay? And he knew they were going to kill him too. Okay? He, gave an, he gives a parable about it in another place. Okay? And stonest them that are sent unto you. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her blood under her wings, or brood, I'm sorry, under her wings, and you would not. See, that's what the prophets were coming, was to do, was to help gather the, the Israel of God to under to God. You know, that's what he had the prophets do, and he was warning them. They are, you know, these guys are all messengers of God. They're all bringing the, the, the word of God to the people. The, that was going, what was going on. And, he, and they were all trying to bring the brood or all those that are part of Israel under his wings and he would not. Okay? He wouldn't let him. Behold, your house is left unto you. Desolate. Okay? And for truly I say unto you, you shall not see me until the time come when you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of Elohim. This word the Lord here is akin to the word Elohim. Okay? Chapter 14. He warned them of all these things, and then it says, And it came to pass, as he went to the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. They were watching him to see if he could make a mistake, because they wanted to find a reason to take him out. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy, or it says this could have been translated a demon. The dropsy is like when your face swells up and it really looks like you're in bad shape, okay? So it's talking about swelling. And Jesus, or Yahushua, answering, spake unto the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, Is. And so before he does it, he already knows what they're going to say because they said it just a couple days before here. He says, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Just going to see what these Pharisees got to say about this before he does it. And they held their peace. And he took him. And he healed him. And let him go. And here's the same answer comes again. And answered them saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit? And will not straight away or immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him again to these things. And he put forth a parable to those which were be forbidden or called. Okay. When he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, "Now it's not the first time he says the, the priests like the, the the best rooms, the places inside the feast." Okay. They always want to do that. They want to pray in public. He's putting it right there to them. Okay. And so he said that he says, "When that, now he's looking at them." And he's, and he's being straightforward with it. He says, When thou or you are called of any man to a wedding. He's talking about and this here's example talking about the wedding supper of the Lamb. Okay? Sit now down in the highest room. Okay? He's going to, he's using scripture here. Least a more honorable man than you be bidden of him. Okay? I'm going to go read. Proverbs in just a minute, but I want to read this. And he bade, and he that bade you or invited you, and him come and say to you, Give this man your place, and you begin with you begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden or called, go and sit down in the lowest room. This is again the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. That when that when he that bade or invited you comes he may say unto you, Friend, go up higher. Then shall you have worship, or you have praise, or honor. 
And it's basically because you've humbled yourself in the presence of them that sit at food or meet with you. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted or lifted up. Let's go look at Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs 27. Proverbs 27. We're going to, I'm going to read in verse 1. I'm going to read in verse 1. My pages stick together. I can't get them separated. It takes me a bit all the time. Okay. Proverbs 27. No, 25. My goodness, I did that one, right? And I looked at 25. Correct myself. Gives me seven as a uh, verse to read, but I'm going to read the first seven verses so we get the full meaning. These are also Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, or Yehuda, copied out. It is the glory of Elohim to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. So God keeps the secret things for himself sometimes, but it's the honor of kings. And all of us that are joint heirs with him will be in kind of that status, okay, if we're in that first resurrection. So it's an honor of kings is to search out a man or find out the truth. Verse 3, the heaven for height and the earth for depth, and the heart of the kings is unsearchable. Now, that's the kind of heart God's looking for, the one that wants the truth, that seeks everything out, and wants nothing but what God wants him to have. And here's what he, here's Part of the painful process, though, to get into this. God is refining us. He is putting us through all kinds of tests constantly. If you are a servant of God and you're not being tested and you're not being chastised, then you're not a son. He says, take away the dross. This is the heart of, of, of the servant from the silver. And there shall come forth a vessel for a uh, for finer or for refiner. Take away the wicked from before the king. That's talking about those that are the servants of the Most High. And his throne shall be established in righteousness. Put not forth thyself in the presence of the king. Now this king is not us. And stand not in the place of great men. For better it is that it be said unto you, Come here, then that thou shouldest be put lower in the presence of the prince whom thine eyes have seen. That's what he's referring to. So, all of us that are coming to be servants of our Messiah, okay? Part of that body, though, that first resurrection, that priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, we're being refined. We've got to identify that. We got, we're going to continue to be refined. It's not a, it's an ongoing process. It's not going to come to an end as long as we're in this life. We've got to endure to the end. And he's going to be taking away the dross. And it's going to be painful. We're going to want to know why sometimes. And the why is that. Okay? Verse 12. Back to Luke chapter 14, verse 12. Then said he also to him that called him. Okay? When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not your friends. Now, obviously we always want to go to our family and friends and we're trying to call them into the kingdom. But remember, many are called, few are chosen, and some of them aren't called at all. Nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid you again and repay or recompense be made you. But when you make us a feast, and he's referring, talking about the wedding supper of the Lamb, this is a parable, call the poor, the lame, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompay or recompense or repay you. For you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. That's the first resurrection. 
Right now, right now, excuse me. Right now, it's going to be hard. He's going to put us through the fire every day. When we get up, we're going to wonder what we're doing wrong. Might not be what you're doing wrong, guys. It might be what we're doing right. We're being refined. We're being read. We're getting made ready for the resurrection of the just. We're not there yet. None of us. We're still trying to be right. We're trying to develop those fruits of the Spirit that sometimes are hard to show up because we still got the old man. We still got this flesh that we got to die daily. And we're going to mess up, guys. I don't care who you are. You're going to fall short. You got to get back up every day and you got to work on self. This one, the guy inside. We got to become like Christ. And that's that refining process that he's talking about. And that's hard. And it's painful. And, 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 and we're going to talk about counting the cost. You know, we get on to people that sit on the fence. Maybe they're counting the cost. Maybe they don't think they're ready. We shouldn't take on more than what we're ready to take on. Okay? But if God's calling you, don't, res don't uh, resist that spirit that's on you. Verse 15. And when one of them that sat at food with him, just one of these Pharisees that he went to their house, heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of Elohim, or Theoi. Amen. Blessed is he that's in that first resurrection. Holy, set apart is he that's in that first resurrection. And you don't just get that. you got to work through this. you got to endure all these things we're talking about until the end. Verse 16. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper. Now this certain man he's talking about is God. Okay? And bade him, or, invi and, 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 or invited many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden. These are ones that are invited. This is not the wife. This is not the ones that are married to him. He's talking about the ones that are bidden. Come for all things are now ready. Got the feast ready. Everybody come. Boy, I'll tell you what. He's been having a feast on his appointed times. All the way down through time. And he's been invading the body to come. And they're not coming. And when he invites you to come and you don't come, he's not cutting you off. You are. When you choose to believe somebody else over the word of God, that's what happens. So, listen to what he says. Many were invited. And he sent that servant at supper time to say to them that were called or bidden or invited, Come for all things are now ready. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuses. Let's don't make excuses, guys. Let's fight the good fight. The first said unto him, I have brought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. Or I need to take care of it before I go. That's the way a lot of times when God calls us in our life, that's the one sitting on the fence. Okay? Don't sit there too long. But you got to count the cost. But don't sit there too long. I pray thee that I may be excused. Please, I won't be able to make that speech. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. And he's quoting Deuteronomy 24, 5, and that's saying when a man marries his wife, let him take a year to sit there and be with his wife and pleasure his wife. Well, you know, that's true. But if God calls you to the wedding supper of the Lamb, you better put down that old life, and you better pick up the new one. And don't wait too long to make up your mind. Because about the time you make an excuse, you might not have the opportunity. 21. So that servant came and, sh and showed his master, his Lord, these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor. So, showing you the ones he asked first. They all said, I ain't got time. I'm going to go do what i got to take care of. Got land, got whatever. Ain't got time. I'm living life in the flesh. Okay? And maimed, and the halt, and the blind. Go get those. Those are the people that are looking for help, man. They're ready. And the servant said, Lord, our master, it's done as thou hast commanded. And yet there is still room. 
more than just the poor and the lame and the maimed and the blind. Okay? And the master said unto the servant, Go out into the highways. That's what we're to do. That's why when the Messiah ascended up there on that 40th day of the Feast of Weeks, he went back up to God. Last like thing he said, he said, Go throughout all the world seeking those that are and, 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 and getting and calling them and then baptizing them. And then he said, and teaching them all things whatsoever I've commanded you. I hear a lot of preachers talk about that, but they never say teaching them all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And that's what we are to be doing. We've got to go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that, may, that my house, the Lord's house, may be filled. Well, there's not going to just be the first resurrection and they're going to be married and that's going to be it. They're also got all these guests and those are all, that's the second resurrection, folks. That's what he's talking about so that his house can be filled. Okay. I lost my spot. 24. Thank you. <laughs> For I say unto you that none of those men, and he's talking about those men that he invited at the beginning were bidden shall taste of my supper. Because they decided that they didn't have time or they didn't want to do it right now. They're going to do their thing. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father. Now do you think God thinks you're for now what the one of the commandments says, Honor thy father and thy mother. Obviously not Hate them like that. But he means compared to how much you love God, it should be as far apart as almost hate. Okay? So you can't pick mother. You can't pick father. You can't pick wife. You can't pick children, brethren, sisters, yea, and his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. That's not easy, guys. That's talking about laying down our physical life. Doesn't mean you got to die, but I mean putting it over here on the side and picking up this commandment that he just gave us and doing what he said. If we decide not to do that, we're not going to be in the in the kingdom. Not, we're not going to taste of that stuff. Not going to be a spouse in. I mean, you're not going to be a spouse in it. You're not going to be a guest. You won't taste of my stuff. Twenty-five. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, so. He had great multitudes, probably both physical Israel and other ones that were following to hear what he had to say. In 26, he says, If any man come to me, oh, let me finish that, father, mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sister, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. 27, there's where I should have started. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You know what our cross is, guys? We, we may not have to hang on a stake or stutros in Greek like our Messiah did, but you got to lay down your life like he did. you got to do what the Father's will and not your own. Okay? If we can't do that, we can't be his disciple. we got to pick up our cross or bear our cross, the burden he's given us, and come after him, we cannot be his disciple. For which you, which of you, intending to build a tower or a house, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost? That's what I was talking about earlier. you got to sit down and count the cost. You don't want to start building a house and become a fool. Well, you don't want to be a common servant of the Most High God and end up becoming a fool. Okay? You don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. You're not only making yourself a fool, you'll make God one. That's not what he's calling us to do. He says, For which of you intend to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he suffers, or, or whether he has sufficient to finish, at least happily, or happily, after that he hath laid the foundation, is not be able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him. That's what we don't want to do. We want we got to be a good and just servant of the Most High God, who our Messiah. Thirty. Saying this man began to build, saying this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first and con 
and consult it or consider it, whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him against come against him that has twenty thousand. You don't think about that before you come to do it. You don't believe you can do it. You better stay home because you're getting ready to get slaughtered. Okay. First of all, you better not go with an army like that unless God spoke, whispered in your ear and told you to do it. But if you do go to do it, you better make sure in your heart that you believe you can accomplish that with 10,000 against 20, or you're going to perish. you got fear, you got doubt in your heart, you're not going to make it. 32. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage, or an ambassador, and desireth conditions of peace. See, that might be the best route. And it probably always is to take the peaceful route. So likewise, whoso, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. I don't mean we got to leave him, but we got to stay on the course, guys. We got to stay the course. I don't care how hard it gets. If we don't, we're not going to be at the wedding supper. We're not going to be married to Christ. We're not going to be there. We're going to be over in the gulf, on the other side of the gulf. That's what it is, because he's called us. Okay? It's obvious. The key of understanding that the teachers today have does not come without being called. Now, it's our choice how which way direction we want to go with that. But that key of understanding comes from the Spirit of God. Uh, Salt is good, but if that salt has lost its savor, is good, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salt seasoned? Or what good, how can you use it for seasoning if it lost its savor? We can't lose our savor. It is neither fit for the land, in other words, to use in the land, nor yet for the dunghill. But men cast it out. He that had ears to hear, let him hear. Remember, God's the one who opens ears and opens eyes and does all that. If you don't got them, you don't don't matter. That's why he's speaking in parables. 15, 15, I'm going to run through it. Then drew near unto him all the publicans, or the tax collectors and sinners, for to hear him. Now remember, he said before, he didn't come to the well, he come to the sick. And that's what he's doing. He's going to those that need it. He's doing what his father commanded him to do, what he just covered in his parable. He's going out to the sick and to the lame and to the halt and all the ones that really aren't fit for the kingdom of God. Okay? But that doesn't mean they can't repent. Remember, he warned us of that in the beginning of chapter 13. you got to repent. At least you repent. And then he says, And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. You know, we know that it's a shame to even eat with somebody. That, that, but that's somebody that's been called and is living an abominable life. That's the one that's not fit to eat with. Okay? So you got to make sure. You, and, and they're the one judging this other guy. And they're themselves are the hypocrites are the ones that ain't fit to fit in the kingdom. Okay? So, and he spake this parable unto them, saying, again, why does he speak in parable? Because he wasn't for them to really fully understand what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? Every one of them is just as important as any one of those Pharisees. That's what he's telling them. He said, and he's going out after that other sheep because he's the shepherd, okay? And he's he's gathering the flock, okay? And then if we're a a, a, a minister, a servant of his, that's what we got to be doing. If we're scattering the sheep, we're not his servant. We're working for the other side. Okay? We're either gathering the sheep or we're scattering the flock. Okay? Okay, and then he says, And when he hath found it, that one that had strayed, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing, and when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me. For I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in the in heaven. Not that this person's in heaven, but they'll be rejoicing up in heaven. The angels of God and God and our Messiah, you know, they're, they're rejoicing. Okay? 
over one sinner, like these publicans and sinners that he was going talking to, and that repented, not just that they listened, but they repented, and repentance does not mean feel just sorry, that means making a choice and turning away from that sin. More than over the 99 just persons that he already has in his flock, which need no repentance. Eight, either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, think about that, how God feels about each one of us. You know, He created us, every one, and it's His will that none would perish, even though He knows that's not going to be the way it goes. So, it's like a woman that lost this piece of silver that doth not, what woman, either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle, and sweep the whole house, I put the hole in there, and seek diligently until she finds it. See, God knew us from the beginning of creation. Not that you existed in them, but God knew it, who you were, and that He was your, that He was going to call you, and, and whether or not He was going to choose you. You got choice in that, but He knew it. He knew what you were going to do. Okay? And when she had found it, just like our Father, she calleth her friends, and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. I've heard people teach a sermon on that, and call that the Sabbath day. Pretty nice parable, but I don't think that that's what he's talking about. He's talking about each one of us here. That's what was lost. Ten, likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels. And this angel, again, means messenger of Elohim, Theo in the Greek. Over one sinner that repented. Guess what? Our problem is we all sinners. It don't make a difference what our position is. We're the head of the whatever. You know, we're still sinners. We all need repentance. And he said, a certain man had two sons. We know where he's going with this. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall up to me. So, he just like everybody else in the world that's in our own flesh and we're growing up. He said, I don't want to wait for the reward, Father. He says, give it to me now. Okay, let me go ahead and go live my life. Do what I want to do. Give it to me now. We all want it that way. Ain't always the best way, but we want it that way. And he just divided unto them his living. He did what he wanted because most of the time, if it's you know not going to be a destruction to you, God gives you what you want. He don't give you a snake if you ask for a loaf of bread. He don't do that. And then he said, And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into the far country, and there wasted his substance, his money, all that had been given to him, with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine. And let me tell you something, guys. We might be on the edge of that right now. In case you're not discerning the signs of the times, there's a lot going on in this world, in this physical earth right now, that we could see a dirt like this, okay? So he says, And when he had spent all that he had, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be wanton or in need. He didn't have anything. He didn't have money to buy any food. He didn't have place for shelter. He didn't have anything because he squandered it on riotous living. Okay, and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into this citizen, sent this guy out into the fields to feed his pigs or his swine. Gave him a job, and he would feign, or and he longed to have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. Gave him nothing to eat, and that was. Part of his refining, guys. He's being tested. He's getting prepared to receive. Okay? Even though he messed up big time. But he's going to repent. Okay? And he's going to get that robe. And he's going to get that ring. Let's, let's go on. And when he came to himself. In other words, when he figured out what was going on, he realized. He said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger. I mean, you know, the Bible says that no servant of God is ever going to do without food. I guarantee you, I ain't never done without food. God's always 
gave me plenty. Sometimes I abused it and ate too much. Okay? But he's always fed me. And, and that's what this is all about, guys. It's about our Father taking care of us. And if we walk away from Him for a time, we make a backslide, we need to come back. We need to throw ourselves at His feet and say, Father, forgive me. I didn't know what I was doing. I'm still, I'm still human. I'm not there yet. That's what's getting ready to happen. He says, I arise and go to my Father. And that's what we got to do. we got to repent of what we did wrong, and we got to rise to the Father, and we'll say unto Him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and, no, and, and am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. That's humbling yourself. And He arose and came to His Father, but when He was, uh, was yet a great way off, his father saw him. You know, and, and, and Jesus was talking about that. Well, you know, how you go after that one out of the 90 and 9 and all that. And God the Father's like that. He's up there right now. And every time one of his people say, well, we just heard, I'm no more worthy to be your servant. Here, here he is. He sees you from afar off. And he's ready to come running after you and had compassion. And ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. See, that's how that's a forgiving God. But this there was repentance first. It wasn't continuing riotous living. It was to repent and, and tell and, and show them for what we are. In verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was a great way off, his, okay, I already read that. 21. And the son said unto him, Father, I've sinned again. He said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. And am no more worthy to be called your son. And that goes, we all know that's going, that, that relates to Job, and that goes, this is ta also talking about that uh, prodigal son. Okay? This, the, it's the same parable. Okay? What? Thank you. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe. See? But he wouldn't have got that best robe. So this is re this is using this as an analogy of us putting on that white robe when we get ready to go into the kingdom. He said, "Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and show shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, because he's going to have a feast." And again, he's he's talking about this feast of the marriage supper of the Lamb, and let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead. And is alive again. He was lost. He is found. And they began to be married. See, now he's going to go back to the Pharisees. The rest of this parable, and it's part of that prodigal son. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and he asked what things meant, what this, what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother has come. And instead of him being rejoicing because his brother was back, which he thought probably was dead, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf because he received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out. And entreated him or pleaded with him. Now we know there's a lot of Bible prophecy that's tied into all this. You know, Israel, God's going to plead with them too. Okay? But you also heard what happened to those ones that didn't come to the feast before that. You know, if God calls you and you, re and you reject him, you know, there might not be a second chance. You better answer the call. Okay? Verse 29, And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a goat, or a little, kid, a little goat, a kid, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this your son was come, which have devoured your living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. 
It was meet, fitting, that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and now is found. That's where we're going to end our study. Hopefully that everybody got something out of this and that we all might be edified. And if you've got any comments, concerns, questions, contact us at Philadelphia Assemblies at gmail.com or FOTS at gmail.com. May God bless you.